and welcome to Virtual Darwin Day. My name is Greg Scooping, and I'll be the host for today's program. Uh, a couple of things before we get started. First of all, uh, a big thank you to the anonymous donor who made this event happen. Um, uh, we'll have virtual programs all day today. And if you didn't know, we'll also be in person on the plaza outside of the museum this coming Saturday the 13th from 10 to 3 p.m. So if you're in the area, we'll hope that you'll join us on Saturday. But all of today, we have programs about everything related to mammal evolution. And uh, before we jump into it, just a quick Zoom tutorial. I'm sure you're all pros by now, um, but we do have closed captionings available for this program. So to access those, just uh, click on the very bottom there where it says CC or closed captionings. And if you click uh, on sub show subtitles, you'll be able to go in there and edit those. So you can make them bigger or smaller to your preference. While viewing today's program, we recommend the speaker view. So click on that top right and select speaker view. You want it side by side so you can see the presenter as well as their slides. And then by dragging that vertical bar, you, you can make those screens larger again to your preference. And we want you to be active in the chat. Of course, let's be good digital citizens. Let's keep things relevant and uh, friendly. To get that chat going, I'm gonna drop an icebreaker question in there right now. So we're gonna learn all about glyptodons, which are these big armadillo-like animals. So if you had a pet armadillo the size of a car, what would you feed it? What would you feed it to keep that animal happy? Drop your answers in the chat and we'll get that chat going. And please, if you have questions throughout the program, put them there and we will ask our speaker. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for the day. Irina Podgorny is a permanent research fellow at the Argentine National Council of Science. Irina's current research projects deals with historic extinctions and animal remedies. Welcome to the program. We're so excited to learn about glyptodons this morning. Irina is a permanent research fellow at the Hi. Argentine National Hi, Council Greg. of Science. Hi, Greg. Thank you very much. Irina's current and, research and projects And thank you to all the team from the North Carolina Natural History Museum Welcome for inviting to me to this event. We're so excited to learn about so, glyptodons. I am a historian from, of science from Argentina. Hi, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, Irina, I, one, uh, one second, please. I'm hearing some feedback. I'm hoping that yeah. I can... Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this event. So, um, I am a historian because I wait time for my computer. I'm not sure that. I don't think I have the YouTube. Uh, maybe I have. And? And now? I think that did it. Yeah, but wait. And I don't see you anymore. So, how do you? Okay. Yeah, here. Yeah. It's okay? Yes, that's better. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, again, thank you for inviting me to this event and to the Darwin Says to talk about my research. Actually, I am a historian of science from Argentina, working at the Museo of La Plata, another natural science museum in, in our days, um, which has a um, very nice collection of fossil mammals from South America. So, um, my topic of research in connected to the history of science, my field, is the trade in fossil bones in the 19th century, especially the trade in uh, fossil um, mammals from, from the Americas and, and the exchange of bones and the selling of bones to the European museums and to the North American museums. Um, I work in a period that is very close to the period of Darwin's travel to South America and his collecting of uh, bones. But it, I, 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 I'd rather tell a, a parallel story, which is connected with um, the discovery and the, and the um, description of new species and new uh, uh, kinds that uh, were being discovered in the 1820s and the 
thirties, um, especially in the in, in 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 the period that in in South America is connected with the the emergence of the new republics and the new um, political entities after independence from the Spanish monarchy. So my this is more or less what I do. And uh, I work especially in, in, in the definition of um, one of the new kinds, which is called glyptodon, which you had mentioned before, Greg, and you described very well as a giant armadillo the size of a car. So if you, you can present the first slide, please. So this and the second. <laughs> so this is the glyptodon, and this is exactly the the, the 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 animal. So this giant armadillo with his with a shell and a tail, a bony, a scaly a, a structure covering this huge animal that um, was described for the first time uh, as glyptodon in 1839. But before. This animal got its shells, uh, its shell. Um, there was another animal. Please, next slide. This was, well, this is a, a representation of this animal called Megatherium, which means great beast, and was discovered or, or a complete, almost a complete skeleton of this animal was discovered very close to Buenos Aires, the capital of. Uh, the, uh, of Carmen, Argentina. It was discovered late in the 18th century by, by a, 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 a priest and, and the skeleton was uh, shipped to Madrid, to the Royal Cabinet there, and, and, and was described as a great beast. It was unclear if this animal was still alive somewhere in the Americas, and which kind of, it was completely unknown and the skeletons was such, of such a big size that no one could tell um, what kind of animal this was. It was first named um, uh, in, in, in the late 18th century by Georges Cuvier in, in France, in Paris, as Megatherium, uh, which is the translation of great beast. Um, and Cuvier uh, presented these animals as a kind of giant extinct sloth. So it was a ground sloth um, with because of, of the, the shape of, of the uh, of its um, teeth and and, and, and and legs. And and it was the only fossil complete skeleton from the Americas that was exhibited in, in a European museums for many decades. So it was the only specimen, it was the only skeleton, and all museums in Europe and in North America wanted to have one similar to this huge, extraordinary beast being presented in Madrid as that exceptional animal. So uh, uh, next slide, please. The thing is that every, every single bone that was being described or discovered in South America was at the beginning attributed to, me, to Megatherium, the only animal um, the only skeleton that was found in, in such a way. So this, this sketch that I am presenting here is a kind of fight and a kind of uh, dialogue between this megatherium and another skeleton, uh, which is claiming that the structure, which is a shell put on the megatherium back, in fact, belonged to him or, or to her because, you know, it is, we don't know uh, if it was a she or, or a he. But anyway, so the story I am going to tell is how um, uh, from one fossil giant, a naturalist um, made two animals and again, this megatherium lost itself that was 
uh, given to uh, the glyptodon. So next slide, please. As I said before, Megatherium has been described in the uh, late 18th century. It was presented first in Buenos Aires, uh, then in Madrid. The skeleton was mounted in the Royal Cabinet in Madrid. It was very popular. It was a skeleton that attracted uh, much attention from naturalists all over the, the world or, or all over the learned world. Uh, there were visits uh, to the Megatherium in Madrid. There were requests um, to have a copy, a cast of the, that skeleton uh, from many museums, from the Parisian Museum, from Paris, from London. They asked uh, the, the, the Madrid Museum staff to make a copy, to make a cast, to allow them to inspect the skeleton uh, which was protected by a, a kind of cage. Um, but mm, the Madrid Museum didn't allow other naturalists to, to, to observe, to cast this specimen. And when um, Carmen de Argentina uh, became independent uh, from, from Spain uh, and, the new, uh, and the new Republic was recognized by other countries and consuls started arriving to Buenos Aires, consuls arrived to that city with the uh, request of trying to find another complete skeleton to be shipped to um, either to London, either to Paris. So there was a, a, um, a kind of um, uh, demand uh, regarding uh, megatheria skeletons, and and, and 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 every consul was trying to find um, something to present to their governments and to their um, uh, local institutions to um, uh, answer to that request. Uh, next, next um, slide, please. In, in such a way, the British consul um, uh, will, um, Parish arrived to Buenos Aires and he could succeed in, in, in shipping not a complete skeleton, but at least um, something that could help the, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons and the London and, and, in, in, and British institutions in, in, in England to have at least a part of that skeleton, at least a part of megatherium. And, and, and when the, these uh, pieces arrived uh, to, to London, the consul requested to cast it and to present it to different institutions. So the, the, the parts found by the consul were um, um, presented as a cast to, to other English um, museums and collections. So, but, and, and the description of this skeleton was made in such a way that William Clift, the curator of the collections at the Royal College of Surgeons, um, marked um, with a different color uh, what parts were still remaining. And the next, please. And in such a way, the first was the manuscript, and this is the published version. And in such a way that he, uh, the, the William Clift, uh, through consular networks, sent this copy of this plate back to Argentina in order to instruct local people to find the remaining pieces. So this search for um, megatherium bones uh, in South America was something promoted through net consular networks. And, and this is happening, this is happening in a parallel way to Darwin's travel. So the next please. So the, 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 the story goes, it's, it is a, it's more complicated. It's not only the British consuls and agents working uh, in, 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 in this direction of exchange, but the local naturalists, such as the, um, the local priests uh, that, that were in possession of 
private collections. They started uh, very early in the 19th century, uh, finding also remains and comparing with these bones uh, being collected in Spain, in England, in France. And in such a way, the, 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 the uh, I will use the, the, the word Uruguayan, but in that, those days, Uruguay didn't exist. So, but the Uruguayan priest, Damaso Larrañaga, a naturalist, a, 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 a botanist, a, 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 a collector who owned a private collection in his house, found these pieces in, 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 in uh, uh, current, uh, in present day Uruguay, and he attributed these pieces, which is a piece of a uh, shell, uh, a bony shell, this attributed these pieces of fragmented bony shell to the megatherium and sent a letter to Paris, uh, to, the, to the Paris Museum, expressing the idea or manifesting the idea that the megatherium was uh, an animal covered by a kind of shell. Uh, it, and, and next, next slide, please. In such a way that Megatherium was presenting a, a kind of hairy, but also a scaly mammal. If you see in this picture, you see here a presentation of Megatherium, um, half covered by hair, ha half covered by scales, and a kind of a pangolin, a kind of, it is not an armadillo, but has scales in, in a, a covering um, its, a, Dermis. So next, next slide, please. So when Clift sent the, the, the curators, the Royal College of Surgeons, sent these images, he also published a map about the distribution of the findings in the province of Buenos Aires. This maybe you cannot recognize it, but this is part of, um, of Buenos Aires. Uh, the, the, the line the, is the, the river, Rio Salado, the Salado River, which was the boundary with the native population. And also the places in mark, are, are marked here where the bones um, had been found and in those places there was the association again the same association the Uruguayan priest had found in uh, Uruguay the association between megatherium bones and these fragments of HL. So next slide please. So this is a this very long story of exchange of letters. This is, no, I am not going to read these letters, but uh, this, uh, please the next two slides. Uh, we, we can uh, stay here. But these letters are uh, from the people looking for the bones in Buenos Aires. This is uh, um, uh, well. This is a letter between uh, Goodwin Parish, the British consul, and, and 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 William Cliff, the curator of the Royal College of Surgeons in London, um, dealing with the person in Buenos Aires that was offering a complete skeleton of um, different animal kinds, different animal bones uh, to, to be sold uh, to the uh, British, uh, uh, to the English museums. So um, the thing is that the, the, how the, 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 the search for these bones activated um, the search, the local people, the local collectors, and a kind of local new profession, which was which was the um, the the search, the, the seekers of, of of bones and skeletons, uh, to be sold uh, to the uh, collectors or to the institutions that were wishing them. <clears throat> so they they knew because they received these publications, even Darwin's publications, or they bought uh, Darwin's publication, and they were aware of the value attributed to those bones, which were 
very, very common in, in the Pampas, in the Buenos Aires region, uh, they, that were treated as uh, stones in a region where stones are not common at all, that were used um, uh, for um, preparing the, the fire to, to cook, to, to boiling, to boil water. So these, these things were very uh, common. They were part of the landscape. They were treated as nothing valuable, but there were some actors in, in Buenos Aires and in Montevideo that were reading all the news, uh, scientific news being published in, in Paris, in, 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 in London, and discovered that they could make a living selling bones to the, uh, uh, the, those people interested in those pieces of what they consider just rubbish, rubbish. So this is, um, these letters, the next please, are showing the, 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 the exchange between people, the, the, between dealers in old bones and competitors which wanted to uh, take advantage of this demand that was happening abroad and trying to present themselves as the only ones that could help in getting the bones that were requested uh, in, in, in London and in Paris and also in Berlin. So there were travelings here, you know, we, we know that Darwin uh, brought with him uh, some pieces, but the thing was how to resolve the first having an specimen, an specimen as Madrid did, so this complete uh, a skeleton of megatherium, uh, but also to try to solve the problem that was posed by the fragments found in, um, in, in Uruguay, uh, by the ideas um, proposed by the Uruguayan priest about the uh, scaly, bony, a structure of megatherium. So there was a, 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 a lot of problems connected with how really the megatherium looked like, like and, 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 and also how to trust in those discoveries that happened far away from London and Paris. So these letters are about these exchanges, these doubts, these um, offers, these um, hopes, um, competition, um, people trying to lie, to say how, how to uh, trust, how to trust uh, uh, in, in, in people you don't know, and they are promising to send you a wonderful beast, an extraordinary beast that no one uh, in Europe, even in the Americas, no one had, has seen, but now was appearing uh, as extraordinary animal from the past with extraordinary size and uh, with extraordinary structure. So next slide, please. So the thing is that thanks to the consul and the, the British consul we were talking about um, and his replacement, the next consul, these people involved in this, the discovery of new species and new skeletons, um, they found this, um, uh, this, again, these pieces of a shell but one of the dealers uh, working in Argentina, um, a, a pilot um, uh, from, from Italy uh, working there, uh, sent to the new British consul in, in, in Buenos Aires a, a, a sketch of what a new animal with this, which was more or less this one I am showing here. So that presented another kind, a kind of a turtle, as they said, um, and also sent um, a, and, and, and sold a, to the consul a, a, a tooth that was shipped to England. So I, I was presenting and showing the letters because in this story, the letters are is one of the main protagonists 
uh, of, of, of how an animal is um, shaped and how an animal got its shape. Because as happened before with the megatherium, Cuvier, the French anatomist, never saw with own eyes the animal, the skeleton mounted in Madrid. He only received a, a sketch of the animal. And with this sketch, he created a new kind. The same happened in a way with Glyptodon. Glyptodon was shipped first as a sketch. This sketch I am presenting here without the feet. And a, a tooth was shipped to England. And on the basis of that tooth and the sketch, Richard Owen, which is known because he uh, described the fossil mammal collections that Darwin brought back uh, to England, Richard Owen created a new genus, which he called Glyptodon, and which was different uh, to Megatherium. And in that way, Glyptodon was created with a shell and Megatherium lost, lost this shell that was attributed uh, to, 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 to it. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So the thing is that in 1839, Glyptodon was created. It was very difficult, again, to transport. So one thing was to ship the sketch. One thing was to transport um, the, the, the tools. But to transport the shell was very, very difficult because once the shell was extracted from the soil, um, the shell fragmented and it was lost. so people were, so these dealers in Buenos Aires were trying to find a solution to ship the shell to, to London. Um, but for many years, uh, the glyptodon um, could not be presented uh, in its real shape because the shell couldn't arrive uh, or couldn't be reconstructed in London because only pieces arrived. Uh, so this is the skeleton of Glyptodon without the shell. Uh, next slide, please. But after many, many attempts, so people are starting, uh, naturalists are starting a uh, mounting glyptodon. This is a, a, an image from the glyptodon in the 1860s in Argentina. Uh, so different species, different kinds, different um, genera were created. And uh, the next please. And you know, the tails and the, the, the shape of the um, S well, they are not scales in the in the proper sense, but the, the, the pieces that compose the um, the shell were described. The these these pieces uh, helped to this create the the new uh, the patterns of this um, shell. Uh, helped to to create new species, new kinds. Uh, the next, please, and. Uh, in such a way that uh, by the end of the 19th century, this animal became a kind of icon of the Pampas, um, and especially from modern Argentina, uh, um, much more than the Megatherium. The Megatherium was mo more connected to the colonial history, and but the Glyptodon is something connected with the 19th century and with the this. Um, uh, nature of the pampa, which would, would produce this mighty skeleton in, skeletons in such a way that in the new Museum of La Plata established in 1884, um, a train of glyptodons was presented, uh, was displayed. This is a picture from the <coughs> late 19th century, early 20th century in La Plata, Argentina, in the museum where I work. The, the gliptons are not presented in this way today. But as you can see, eh, La Plata was exhibiting this um, abundance and this um, extraordinary 
richness that the Pampa had to offer in terms of paleontology, in terms of kinds, and in terms of mighty skeletons that um, uh, Argentina and South America uh, can offer to the world. So, and um, for finishing, I wanted to show the last slide, which is a, a, a um, it's not from South America, it's from uh, North America, from Mexico. And it is an image that uh, if you visit the New York Natural History Museum, you can observe there. It's, um, it's showing how <coughs> at least a part of the shell is being transported and how difficult and the techniques that had, had to be invented, which are not real inventions because it is, <laughs> application of um, craftsmanship to paleontology, but you see here how the shell is being transported from the excavation <coughs> to the transportation means, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> that is going to be used to um, ship this cryptodon to a museum. <coughs> and with this, and <coughs> I am finishing. I am open to your questions and your comments and what well, and thank you. <coughs> oh. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to leave these two slides up because I, 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 there are some questions about them. So Carrie wants to know if are these all different species of glyptodon or is it all the same species? They have different species and you can see, I, I cannot tell you which species are they. It could be also that some of them are different gen genera. So um, so the, the glyptodon is a genus, and but you have um, a <coughs> beginning the second half of the 19th century, the, the discovery and of these variations depending on the on the um, skeleton, but of course, you know, for, for defining new species, you need different things, but uh, the shape of the scale, the shape, it, 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 uh, um, a new world of these giant armadillos uh, was discovered. And uh, in our days, you have different kinds, different genera of giant armadillos, some of them with the, this this first one is a rigid shell, you know, and it is it is not like the armadillo that can move. But um, later on, it was discovered that there were some fossil uh, giant armadillos that at least part of the shell is uh, movable uh, as the the, the uh, present day armadillo. So so the the amount of kinds of giant armadillos is is really impressive. Yeah. And, and did they all live at the same time? Were there some overlap between these species? Um, some of them were contemporary, some of them no. So, but you know, they were, they, 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 I, I didn't show here, but in the, in the, um, they were contemporary with the first humans arriving to the Americas, you know, and in the, in the late 19th century, uh, the, the, the prehistorians the, the, from Argentina, they even proposed that this shell was the dwelling or the house of the cave. Uh, in, 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 we don't have caves in, Buenos, in, in the province of Buenos Aires, in the Pampas. The Pampas is flat. Uh, and, and so um, those, those doing prehistory, those doing research in, in, in Argentina, they Use the glyptodon first to, to uh, and the association between glyptodon and human remains, uh, bones and, and instru instruments. They use the glyptodon to and the megatherium to argue that the, the antiquity that there, the, the, the humankind uh, was contemporary with this fossil species, and though that there was a prehistory as there was in Europe. We uh, when uh, a moment in the history of humanity when fossil mammals and the humankind was living together. You know, they are mammals. They are not. Uh, they are mammals, and and so 
it is it is in that way. So uh, the glyptodons, the megatheria, uh, were contemporary with the first humans arriving to the Americas. And and I, what I wanted to say that you know in in Argentina, uh, in the Museum of La Plata, but also in the textbooks, um, not today, but in the textbooks I used to have in the. 70s and 80s, uh, you have this representation of prehistoric humanity living in a shell of glyptodon. So glyptodon is associated uh, with this uh, interaction with humans very much. So there is a long period of time in geological, the, the geological uh, deep time, but these animals also were contemporary with the early humans arriving to the Americas. All right, thank you. And then Marcel had a comment. Um, they said that the tail looks almost like a rock drill. Was um, did the tail, what was the purpose of the tail? Did it, did it serve any anything useful like that? Um, you know, it is very difficult to, I think, you know, this kind of tail has, mm, I'm, I'm not a paleontologist. So I am, I am, I am repeating. Uh, uh, so, but, in the case of defense, uh, so, but also can be a kind of balance for this uh, extraordinary, heavy, mighty um, body. So, but always it is difficult to attribute a function to, to in paleontology, uh, you know, you have to do, um, uh, you, are, uh, you are working with hypothesis and, but, it has to do with defense, it has to do with balance, and yeah, yeah. And with the function of big heavy tails in, 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 in the structure of a, an animal body. Okay. And then Carrie has a follow-up. Uh, you said that uh, um, glyptodons and the first humans to arrive in what's now South America were contemporary living there at the same time. Is it thought that humans led to the extinction of big mammals like this? Well, you know, this is a, one of the hypotheses that was proposed, proposed in, um, I think it was in the 1980s for the first time that the extinction of this megafauna uh, was due to the arrival of humans. You know, they, this, we, these big mammals um, as elephants, uh, they don't reproduce so quickly as uh, smaller uh, mammals. So, but the hypothesis, it is, um, it is. It was being discussed, and it is being discussed that the arrival of humans um, is connected with extinction. You know, I was talking last week in a in a seminar about the history of uh, prehistory of archaeological uh, archeo um, geological archaeology, and and. And I was talking to a researcher from Spain that said that is most probably the case that the, the, the extinction of this megafauna is connected to the arrival uh, because they survived many other uh, climate changes in the past. So these kind of animals, but when humans arrived, they disappeared. So, you know, very, when I say very quickly, I say very quickly in geological time which is maybe a long period for, for us, for humans. Yeah. All right, and uh, you mentioned it a couple of times that Darwin traveled through some of these same areas. And I think people, when they think of Darwin, they immediately go to the Galapagos Islands and his work with finches. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about what Darwin did along the mainland of South America? And didn't he find some important fossils there as well? Yes, he did. He did. Um, uh, he did, in, you know, he did travel um, to, to the south, uh, part by ship, but part by land. He accompanied uh, the, one of the campaigns of Juan Manuel de Rosas, the governor of Buenos Aires, who was doing a campaign against the native population in those years when travel, uh, Darwin was there. So he did part by land, part by ship. Uh, he visited some places. But what is important, because when you, we, we talk about uh, Darwin's fossils, um, we never pay attention to the local uh, providers of fossils and, and, the, and the people who indicated Darwin. In the case of, the, of this story, the same thing, you know, there were people saying here, 
you can find bones. Um, and so he visited some places which um, became iconic places in the in the paleontology or in the um, um, yeah in the pale in, in the history of the paleontology of, of South America, such as Monte Hermoso, uh, close to the city of Bahia Blanca, in the south of the province of Buenos Aires, some places in, in the on the coast of Patagonia, and and he recovered some pieces that are, are um, were described uh, in England by Richard Owen, but no none of these pieces that uh, Darwin brought back. Uh, to, to England were complete skeletons. Uh, so the complete skeleton or the almost complete skeleton is associated to, to, to the endeavors of the consul and of the consuls that were there for longer periods of time. You know, you, you, you have to pay, uh, you have to take into consideration that Darwin's travel, you know, he was ex traveling. Uh, and the consuls were there, living there. So there, there, there is the kind of a uh, collection Darwin did was very important. Richard Wayne created new species uh, from, from the Darwin collections. It was Richard Owen who described uh, those mammals, not Darwin. So it's part of Darwin's work, but the, the, the description of the mammals was done by the comparative anatomist Richard Owen. And, um, uh, uh, so he contributed with 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 new species, with new, uh, um, uh, in fact, with new bones that later on were transformed into new species. But the new, uh, this, you know, one thing is creating a new species, and another thing is to have a museum specimen, and 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 there are. These parallel stories about creating a species or, or, or new kinds uh, and having a, a spectacular specimen to exhibit in the museum. And so this story I was telling before is connected to both things. One is the creation of new species and the other one is to, to, to have a, a museum specimen to be exhibited in this case, in the Royal College of Surgeons. Mm. Yeah. And so you mentioned the, the local people having this, this knowledge of where these fossil beds yeah. were at, um, but it also seems like it was kind of a lucrative business, at least for the people who were trading these fossils and sending them back to uh, Europe. Did, you, did the locals, did the indigenous people, did they see any of that money? Because I imagine they were doing most of the work identifying where these things were at and probably helping to collect them. Yeah, so, you know, Buenos Aires had a museum from the early um, 1820s. You know, in 1823, what, what was called the public museum was created, but with in a very weak form. So with no budget in a context of political turmoil and, and war and, you know, this kind of things that happened that the museum existed. And even when survived, it's, it was not very prosperous. There were local collectors with, particular private collections in their own houses, you know, such as La Rañaga in Montevideo, or later on uh, a, a physician uh, called uh, Francisco Muñiz uh, in, in, in Buenos Aires. So you have these local people trying to have a collection, a private collection. You have the, the, the public museum um, with no money to, to organize expeditions. And you have these people buying books investing in books and investing in publication and investing in uh, the discovery of new bones to um, to make a living with that because you know when they when the person was a, 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 a a uh, historian for Naples, living in Buenos Aires. He bought Darwin's and Owen's books, but he bought and read those books because he wanted to see how valuable these bones were. And, and, and he's, he, he thought, if they are spending so much money in publishing those books, that means that these bones are perfect to sell. And so the people doing this kind of work, they read what was being published, 
in England. And even, as I said before, Clift from the Royal College of Surgeons sent the publications and the place to Buenos Aires. So there was a connection. So it is, you know, there was exchanges. And, and, and what, um, they, they, they discovered new things, but they could see also that they were new species. So it was a kind of local knowledge connected with the knowledge produced in England that made people realize that they were in front of new uh, kinds not, this, not yet described. So they were selling these pieces with, the, with no name because they were selling also the glory. So part of the price uh, attached to the bones was, you know, this is a new species. You, you can name it, but it is more expensive because I am selling you a new one. Uh, so there was, but you know, this was a person buying the books and he was not a paleontologist. He didn't want to make a name in the field of paleontology. He didn't know to make a career in the field of paleontology, but he locally hired all other people who were in the field doing the excavation. And I had read the letters, these people, the excavators, uh, sent to him in Buenos Aires. And he, this person described these animals as elephants. So he had no idea what he was finding. And, and, and there is something very interesting from the late uh, 18th century when, when the first megatherium was described, it was mounted in Buenos Aires and it was presented to the local native population visiting the, the city of Buenos Aires in a kind of diplomatic mission. And to see if the native population um, knew that beast or, or was aware what that beast was and they didn't know. So this was also this evidence that this animal had nothing to do with traditions or with um, a kind of local memory of the existence of this animal. So there was something that was very strange to everybody. Uh, the native population, the colonial administrators, the um, the physicians living in Buenos Aires. So, that, but since there was this communication between Europe and, 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 and Buenos Aires, against the idea of isolation, uh, we tend to believe we, we uh, when Buenos Aires was living in, uh, they were aware of the scientific discoveries and the scientific value these things can happen, uh, have, yeah. Thanks. And then my final question is, are these specimens still on display either in Buenos Aires or in Madrid? Yeah, the Megatherium from Madrid is being is presented and, and it is one of the um, stars. You know, in the, 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 it is uh, not in the same building. It was presented in the in the 18th century. Uh, the, the Museum of Natural History in Madrid has a new building, uh, but it is there. You know, the, it is important, I, I think maybe you are going to underline this during today pres, today's presentation, that the, these fossil mammals from the, in the 19th century or in this part of the 19th century were, were the dinosaurs of today, Natural History Museum. So they were stars in, in the exhibitions. So the Megatheon was really a, a big star in the panorama of 19th century uh, museums. And in La Plata, yes, they, they are exhibited in a different way, in a dif not, not in this kind of train as, as I presented you, but this, these gliptodons are still there. So the, the gliptodon in, in London, the gliptodon that was shipped by this dealer, uh, doesn't exist anymore because a bomb in the, in the, um, in the world destroyed the, the, that part of the exhibition. And with that, the, the, the glypton, the shell and the skeleton was destroyed. But in, in Madrid and, 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 and Buenos Aires, uh, they are exhibited. Yeah. Great, well, those are all the questions that I see. Irina, thank you so much for introducing us to the megafauna of South America and the history behind the discovery of these specimens. Like you mentioned, we're going to learn more about mammals and their evolution today. 
we have programs all throughout um, this, this afternoon and even into this evening. And then, as I mentioned at the start of the show, we're also going to be in person Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 13th, uh, in the plaza out front of the Nature Exploration Center in downtown Raleigh. We'll be there from 10 to 3. So we hope that if you're in town, you can join us there for Darwin Day on the plaza. Thanks for joining and y'all enjoy Darwin Day and have a great Wednesday. Okay, thank you and thank you for uh, thank you to to all of you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Record.